Welcome to your Chilean wine tasting at home package. Uh, this, of course, is going to follow our usual format that we do for all of our classes, which is five wines. Today, you're gonna to have two whites, a rosé, and two reds from Chile. Uh, make sure to have some glasses uh, nearby. If you have the luxury of having more than one, you can use a smaller, uh, narrower glass for the whites and rosé, and then you can have the a larger, bold, bigger glass uh, for your reds, just to allow more oxygen to reach the surface. Uh, for temperatures, I always suggest make sure that the whites are chilled uh, fairly cold. However, the uh, Chardonnay and the Rosé both can actually be a little bit warmer than the usual chilled right out of the fridge temperature. So please make sure to follow the notes that were included with this uh, class in your downloadable files if you wanted to have a preview of where you should be, um, when you should be taking them out, when you can be putting them back in the fridge, etc., etc. And then the only other cool thing is because it's at home and I can't be there with you and this is not live, I have conveniently separated each of the different tastings with a little pause screen. That allows you to pause this uh, class if you wanted to stretch this out over a couple of days or if you needed to go and make yourself a new snack or if you wanted to go and make yourself something better to eat, um, grab water, uh, visit the little girl's room, whatever you need to do. So feel free to pause as needed or go ahead and just play through. If you have any other questions uh, concerning these wines, uh, feel free just to always send us an email at dine at wanderfoodandwine.ca. So grab your glass and let's get started. So I forgot to mention about having um, water nearby. Um, for anyone who's done enough wine tastings, you know that not only do you need water for um, rinsing things, or just because you're thirsty, uh, kind of provide a buffer in between um, glasses, uh, but it also helps to cleanse the palate. So especially if you're not going to be eating throughout this entire class, it's always better to have uh, some water nearby, just to be a little smart. So we're gonna start with the Boya Sauvignon Blanc first. Beautiful. Okay, so I'm gonna go through a general tasting process in case you've never taken a class with me before uh, or you just need a refresher on the full tasting process. This allows you to um, use all of your senses to really appreciate uh, what is in your glass and what the winemaker intended. So uh, first thing you're gonna do is take a look at the color. And the best way to do that is not just to hold it up to the light because that's always an easy thing, but we always suggest uh, grabbing something white and then if you put something white against it, it kind of blocks out all of the other ambient light, um, yellow tones or anything else, especially if you're gonna be in a darker room, it still just allows you to get the truer color um, for you to uh, look at and examine and acknowledge. Um, it also give you some, um, a better view onto the clarity of the wine. That just means whether it's been purely filtered, whether there's anything kind of sediment, whether it might be foggy, and foggy doesn't mean bad. Um, you'll know if you've come to any of my other classes, there are unfiltered wines out there that are popular and beautiful, and the texture in them is what gives them character. Now, second thing you're gonna do is you're gonna take two sniffs. The first one is just to kind of get yourself familiar with the top notes in the wine. Don't do anything fancy. Hopefully you didn't pour too much in your glass either. So after you have that first sniff, you are going to be able to identify and name the aromas that come to you in your own way of describing them. Uh, the sense of smell is one of those things that you kind of develop as a human as you're growing up. So you may smell certain things and call it something different than others do. So don't feel like there's any right or wrong answer. Myself, I um, just like in the um, tasting notes that were provided, uh, tropical fruit is kind of what picks up for me. Pineapple and mango. I get a little floral and herbal notes to it, but it's definitely um, got a nice acidity just in the nose so far. So I'm anticipating. So now I want you to carefully, depending again how much you put in your glass, just give it a swirl. This allows you to uh, put some oxygen in the wine, open it up a little bit. Now put your nose back in. Now, you're either going to notice new things that you didn't notice the first time, or you're gonna notice that the original aromas that you picked up the first time are now more intense. 
Mm, beautiful. Okay, you waited long enough. Two sips. First one's to cleanse your palate because again, depending on what you were snacking on before you started this class, or if you decided to pregame a little bit and have yourself a, something else, um, this allows you to just sort of um, wash away all of the previous things off your palate and kind of get started fresh. And there's no other way to do that than maybe already having a sip of what you're going to enjoy in a few minutes. Let it roll around your mouth. Mm. Yes, definitely fresh pineapple. Okay, so I'm <laughs> getting distracted. Now go back in. Um, I want you to do the second sip now. Now that you let it sort of sit and linger for a minute. And using that sense of touch, actually let it notice how it's feeling in your mouth and on your tongue. <clears throat> this is also the way to identify um, whether it's a short finish or a long finish to this wine. So a long finish just means that it takes a long time before you don't taste the wine any longer. A shorter finish wine is one of those wines that you've had that's really refreshing and it's great, but is within seconds after swallowing it, you don't really taste anything anymore. So that's what that is. Mm, beautiful. So the Boya is created by the Garcias family and it is uh, from the Leda Valley, which is uh, fairly close to the ocean. Of course, in Chile, most of the things are close to the ocean. This kind of overlooks the ocean. Um, so you're getting the sea breeze to keep things cool. Sauvignon Blanc does really well with uh, that, those cool breezes. But uh, because it is a slightly elevated there, you actually get um, some great granite uh, in the soil composition. And that granite's really going to um, create almost that stone, steely type uh, notes that you get sometimes for Sauvignon Blanc. Uh, it makes it very clean and a clean and fresh palette on it. So this is a fantastic, just when you hear the word ocean, um, always gravitate towards seafood. That would be the first thing that I would do. Something really fresh and delicate. Uh, anything that you would pair um, with something like a, well think now you're talking about it, how about a pineapple salsa? So think like a seared tuna steak and pineapple salsa or uh, fresh shrimp and in some kind of a salad would be beautiful. So this is a, a really good go-to, uh, especially if those who like really great acidic wines, um, this is that uh, bright, fresh, sunshiny thing in a glass. So hope you enjoy it. Oh, and for those who decided to have cheese with this, my suggestion of course is a classic goat cheese. Uh, with this much acidity, a little bit of creaminess and tanginess of a classic goat cheese is a perfect match for this. So you could do a salad that has goat cheese in it. You can have any kind of little fun appetizers with puff pastry or anything that has goat cheese in it. Um, or feel free just to create your, if you didn't buy one from us, create yourself a little cheese board. Um, but nibbling on some goat cheese with this uh, really kind of makes this, this kind of wine stand out. So our second wine is actually from one of the oldest wines in Chile called Santa Carolina. This winery has been in production for almost 140 years now. Uh, so they kind of know what they're doing. This is their Grand Reserva Chardonnay. It's not always easy to find, especially up here in, the, um, in Northern Ontario. Uh, Grand Reserva just means it spent more time in oak prior to bottling and then sent to you. So it's not always easy to find, so I thought I'd treat you with this one. So this little contraption is called a Coravin, by the way. Uh, you'll see me use it quite a bit uh, throughout this class. It helps me to pull wine from the bottle for a tasting or for a demonstration like this, but without taking the cork from the bottle. So yes, it's been pretty handy for us here at the bar. Uh, but the other reason is, is that I'm sharing these bottles with you. So I need to be able to take the wine out and then when you buy this kit, uh, you know that the wine is going to be fresh by the time it's been bottled and it's in your hands. So just like we did for the um, for the first wine, we're going to go through the tasting process again quickly. Now, if you look at this color, you're gonna notice that it's a little bit more in the golden color. It is, depending on, um, it's going to be a little, this wine's a little bit foggy, but not um, nothing sediment-like. So this is the 2017 Grand Reserve Chardonnay but definitely you're getting more of this golden straw color uh, in this Chardonnay, and that's a great indication of how much time it's spent in oak. So now we're gonna go through the same thing, two sniffs, two sips. 
First sniff, what do you smell? Second sniff, I can almost smell buttery notes already. Now let this first one linger. Because of the oak and the bigger mouthfeel, you're gonna notice that this has got a long finish, especially compared to that Sauvignon Blanc that you had. Mm. Normally I would say a big oaky Chardonnay like this would require food for me. Um, because I find that the heavier the wine, the more I want to start pairing food with it to sort of balance it out. Uh, but this is actually a very beautifully balanced um, oaky Chardonnay. I wouldn't say it's quite California oaked, but it's pretty close. Um, it is done from the Itata Valley. Uh, this is the southern part of Chile. There's all kinds of really great mix of soil. Uh, when grapevines have to grow in these complicated soil types, it makes them work a little harder. Uh, so the roots tend to get a little tougher, meaning that they're stronger, more resilient, um, and then produce better fruit. Um, easy growing things don't oh, do so well when it comes to grapevines. So anytime you see any mention on bottles where it's talking about um, wine or grapevines, you know, pushing through things or volcanic rock and granite, and you think, oh, those are hard, it must be difficult, that's a good sign uh, for wine grapevines to succeed in that kind of environment just means that they're tough and that they're going to produce some of its best. <clears throat> so when I mentioned the buttery notes that you would get in this wine, I wasn't kidding. And that again, those buttery, bready, yeasty things, that comes from the, um, the aging in oak barrels. So it spent some time in oak, but it also spent some time in stainless steel. It has a good balance of both, um, but it is a really beautifully, um, balanced wine, meaning uh, acidity, right, as well as the fruitiness and the sweetness levels in it. Uh, so it's still considered an extra dry Chardonnay, but it still has enough of that fruit flavor in it that really kind of lingers. I mean, I'm talking to you now and I'm still tasting it, so that's usually a great indication. Uh, the more a food tends to, um, more a wine tends to have this longer finish, the better it does with food pairings. So you're gonna ask me what kind of cheese goes with this? Uh, think creamy brie, right? So it's all it's gonna do is elevate the acidity um, in this wine, it's gonna sort of marry it out, but that tangy creaminess of a brie is actually a really beautiful match for this because you're already getting those buttery notes in it and it's just going to, they're just gonna elevate the flavor of each other. It's actually a really great one. Um, the other thing that I would really do is a, a beautiful thing like a smoked salmon, I think would be lovely with this as well. Um, so just that creamy, um, uh, even a, a salmon tartare or something like that, I think would be really pretty with this as well. But I think you can uh, probably ex um, experiment with a lot of things. I would say anything with a cream sauce always goes well with a Chardonnay, so think fettuccine alfredo, that kind of thing. Um, I don't think you're necessarily gonna make fettuccine alfredo for this wine class, but you do you. Okay, so I'm lining up all of the wines just like I normally do for a class here. Also helps me keep things in order. But I will include a photo of all of these wines um, in your downloadable files that go along with uh, this video. If you didn't see the links, they'll be in the notes underneath this YouTube video. So you can actually just click and it'll open it up for you. Then you can print if you need to or save the photo to a file. I also included a map of the wine regions of Chile so that you can kind of follow along as well. So we're going into Connoisseur um, Pinot Noir Rosé. Not all rosés tell you what grape they're made out of, uh, but if you're a Pinot Noir fan, uh, I know we sell a lot of this Pinot Noir um, Rosé. Not just this one, but a lot of them are made by Pinot Noir. Um, I find it is fruity enough that it doesn't have to have a higher sugar content, so it's not one of those syrupy styles of blush uh, wines that are popular down maybe in California in hotter climates. This is going to be light, fruity, and fresh. Even before tasting it, I know that. So Connoisseur was only um, founded in 1993, so it's fairly young to, as a winery in Chile, but it's super popular. So the entire Connoisseur Bicicleta line is a great 
find for anyone who really wants to explore some single varietal bottles from Chile. Uh, they are at fantastic price point. They're fairly easy to find throughout Ontario. So just look for the bicycle symbol. We used to have a, a regular here. Actually, he hasn't been in a while uh, because of COVID, obviously. But he used to come in and couldn't remember the name of the winery, but he always remembered the bicycle. So he used to actually ask for the bicycle wine. They make really a couple of great blends, especially for red wine ones. Uh, they do a beautiful Viognier, uh, which is one of my favorite whites that they produce. Um, they also do a just a classic Pinot Noir, but again, price point for what you're getting and the quality is just outstanding. So Connoisseur, as I mentioned, um, was only founded in 1993, so it's fairly new to Chile. Um, again, it's pulling their grapes from the uh, southern part of the country. Um, a little bit cooler, so it does better with those classic uh, cool grape varietals that like we would have here in the Niagara Peninsula. So think um, Pinot Noir, um, some Chardonnay, uh, Pinot Gris, uh, pretty Viognier's. Uh, so some of those grapes actually do really well in this area, um, especially with cooler climates. So as much as you have to remember that you think of a southern part of a country wouldn't necessarily be warm, in Chile it's actually the opposite. So that the farther south they go, actually it's cooler. And uh, I just attended a, an online uh, seminar with some of the winemakers in Chile um, about a month ago, and they were talking about how they are starting to experiment with planting even further south as far as they could possibly go. So it'll be interesting to see what they come up with. So we'll go through exactly the same tasting process that we've done, of course, for previous ones. I want you to look at the color first. And with any Pinot Noir Rosé, you always get this dark salmon color. Um, so depending on the producer and where it's done, um, a Rosé is only the color it is based on the grapes that are used. The grape skins is what gives it the color. So the winemaker will just leave the skins in long enough to get the color that they want and then they strain them out. So if you want any lighter than this, this would be a classic Provencal style, which would be that very pale salmon color. This, uh, the grape skins have been left a little bit longer in here to get a little bit more color on this, but I would call this more of a smoked salmon color, right? Okay, so we're gonna now do two sniffs like we normally do. What did you smell? Definitely get the fruits, but you can always smell the dryness already, which shows you that it's not going to be a, uh, definitely a sweet wine at all. Mm, definitely berries. If you didn't get berries, you gotta take a second sip. Okay, that was beautiful. Again, even with the rosé, it's surprising how much of a long finish. I'm still getting those berry notes, which is still there. Uh, so now I'm thinking about what cheeses uh, to pair with this. Um, I suggested something like a Gruyere. Uh, I'm kind of think to a, what a Pinot Noir would naturally do well with. So you could almost do a Havarti, a Fontina. So something, um, even a Swiss might do really well with this. So just think of something that would go normally well with some kind of a berry sauce or fresh berries. Um, I wouldn't go as far as a cheddar, but one of those mid-range um, cheeses I think would be a really nice match with this. It'll stand up to the, um, the pungent flavors um, that are coming through um, this Pinot Noir. And Pinot Noirs are not just, uh, sorry, rosés are not just for um, girls' night out, by the way. I always tend to suggest to people that when they're not sure what to have, especially for lunch, when you're trying to, you're, bunch of people are going out for lunch together and you're having salads or seafoods or light pastas or things like that especially if you all want to split a bottle if you find a really nice dry rosé similar to this it will go with just about all of them because uh, very rarely is someone going to be having a big steak for lunch well except for my husband but <laughs> but that's this is the kind of a rosé a full-bodied full flavor that you can really do with you know chicken or seafood or um uh lighter fare uh, believe it or not bacon actually does really well with pinot noir so yay for bacon so maybe brunch so now we're going to the um the most popular grape in chile which is carmenere uh it is one of those smoky reds that really elevate things like game meats and sausage. 
Um, yes, it does beautifully with a steak, especially if you find a blend that has carbonara in it, which we'll be discussing shortly. Um, this one from Terra Vega is actually about 93% carbonara. does have a splash of Elefante Bouquet as well as a um, just a hint of Merlot in it, just to give it some roundness and some balance. And again, we're going to use my core of it so I can save the rest for you. So of course, Chile has been producing wine ever since the Spanish decided to uh, make their way in there. Um, they actually brought some great vines with them and we were starting to plant them then. And slowly over the years and over the centuries, uh, the Chileans basically um, learned to plant the right types of grapes um, in the right places with all that different terrain in that long, narrow uh, country of theirs to allow them to have some more complexity um, find the best growing spots for the right grapes and still be able to um, pay homage to the, um, the terrain and the terroir that is natural in Chile. Chile actually is probably one of the most known to be the most environmentally friendly countries, not just for winemaking, um, but for all environmental concerns. And the wineries have consistently been looking towards having um, more organic practices, more sustainable practices, um, really paying attention to uh, the, the earth, their surroundings, and the community where these wines are being produced. So, as always, we're going to do the same thing. I want you to take a look at the color this time. You can hold it up to something white again. Now, this time, because it's easier to see and it's a red, I want you to take a look at the, not just the clarity of the wine, but the color meaning is it dark all the way through? Um, are there some light edges to it? Uh, sometimes you can see the meniscus, which is that natural, almost clear gray ring where the wine meets the glass in the inside. Uh, the smaller that meniscus, the younger the wine. As a wine ages, the wines become darker in color, almost brown in tone, and that meniscus is just going to get larger meaning the wine's almost gonna look like it's losing weight, <laughs> if that's the way you want to put it. So that gives you an idea of what it's going to uh, taste just by looking at it. Second thing I want you to do, of course, is your two snips. Oh, you don't have to dig very far to get the fruitiness on this one. Definitely dark berries, so dark blackberries. You do get a touch of the smokiness to it already without even tasting it. So make sure you add in some lot of oxygen in that. This is a fairly young wine, surprisingly. Uh, so this was only bottled last year. And surprisingly easy to drink now. <laughs> uh, a lot of times uh, red wines tend to have to be um, uh, cellared for a while and um, matured and allowed to rest um, but they have figured it out on something like a Carmenere, and especially with that addition of the little bit of Merlot, really makes a difference um, because it just makes it a little bit more approachable and easy to drink now so that you don't have to wait uh, another five years to dig it out of your cellar. So I'm going to do another sip. So, of course, because it's a heavier wine, this wine's going to do better with a heavier cheese. So, um, even though it's still a young wine, though, so don't go too crazy. I would say um, a classic Menchengo would be lovely for this. Um, you can get away with some of the uh, aged wines, so think like an um, aged Havarti or aged Gouda. You can go into a smoked cheese to really bring out those smoky notes that are naturally in this wine. I would just suggest not going too smoky. Some of the um, smoked old cheddars are so entrenched in smoke flavor that kind of overpowers it. So you still wanna be able to notice those dark berry notes that are also smoked. Uh, anything that has a smoky flavor, just think barbecue, grilled would actually do well. Grilled vegetables, um, kebabs that have chicken or beef and vegetables, um, roasted potatoes on the barbecue. Um, this is a really great um, summer, easy drinking, will always will never disappoint, will please a crowd. Um, and one of my favorite times, the very first time I had Carmen Air and fell in love with it, I actually had just a seared duck breast as part of an entree and that um, the just the the herb crush the crushed herbs that were on the outside of that duck and then the smokiness of this wine was just a beautiful match 
So I always try to t tell people that if you're always struggling and want a perfect match for a carbonara, my always favorite is any kind of game bird. So think duck or goose or venison or something like that. It, it's a, it's, um, it'll surprise you how good it is. Enjoy. And this last wine is one of our new popular ones, and there's probably maybe a handful left around the Sudbury area if you want to dig around for them, and it is the Echeveria uh, Elementos. It is a Cabernet Sauvignon heavy blend that has a splash of Petite Syrah, Petite Verdot, and of course, Carbonaire. Um, gives it a little bit of a smokiness to it. Um, but those extra little um, grape splashes are going to marry with that Cabernet Sauvignon to give it some complexity and roundness to it. Again, with the Coravin. Now this one is actually produced um, from the Maipo Valley, uh, to be more specific, in the Alto Maipo. So Alto just means the higher area. So of course, I mentioned to you about altitude really plays a big part. Um, it doesn't just allow um, for cool breezes to reach from the ocean, but it also allows the winemaker, um, the higher altitude is, the cooler the temperatures, obviously, and especially in these northern areas of Chile, um, you're getting closer to the equator, of course, it's getting warmer, and as much as you still want those juicy flavors um, that come with a, with a really great Cabernet Sauvignon, if it's too hot, it could become almost jammy. So they really want to control it with those cooling temperatures so that the winemaker is um, getting to control the, uh, the original outcome right from the start to the finish. So of course, we're always going to do exactly the same thing we did before. One last time, you're good at this. So look at the color. And again, look at the um, clarity of it. Look at the how deep the color is. Um, is it a light red? Is it a dark red? Definitely looks like a berryish color to me. Uh, look at that meniscus that I mentioned where that colorless rim goes around. Gives you an indication of the age of the wine. But don't be fooled by the weight of it. So just because a wine um, looks like it's going to be light doesn't necessarily mean it's going to be light on flavor. So of course we're going to take two sniffs. First one, second one. I don't have a lot in my glass, so I gotta really gotta give it a push here. Okay, there we go. Mmm, definitely some spice notes to it. First sip, cleanse the palate. Again, we're getting those bright fruit flavors that are known for in Cabernet Sauvignon. And I definitely get the spicy, smoky kind of a finish to it, but it's definitely juicy. Um, as much as that Carbonara was an easy drinking one, um, I find this one I like it because it's a little bit more complex, but it's still easy drinking. Um, and it's just a beautiful expression of what Cabernet Sauvignon can do in a country like Chile, in the right hands, of course. So if you want to get nerdy about this, uh, this wine was actually fermented in stainless steel tanks. Uh, for a period of time and then it was put into brand new French oak barrels for about 12 months uh, before they put it in a bottle and then they eventually sent it to us. When it comes to Cabernet Sauvignon I always think of earthy things so uh, things that are low and slow cooked that are a little complex so things like Moroccan foods and tagines really do kind of well with this. I'm kind of thinking about um, anything with mushrooms would be really good um, I have this really great recipe for this mushroom pate that I'm really anxious to try. Um, it's kind of like a vegan treat, uh, so you can kind of spoil yourself with the richness of mushrooms, uh, but still eat it on bread <laughs> with lots of oil and salt. Um, but there's like mushrooms, and I'm thinking about, um, yeah, so anything that's like slow cooked and rich, um, general st uh, kind of a stew, a chile, classic chili, you know, chili con carne. Um, things with meats, pasta and meat sauce would do really kind of well with this. Uh, nothing that's overly overly spicy, but when I say spices that were noticed in this wine, I think of more complex spices, things that you would find in things like uh, um, a lightly spiced Moroccan dish or some spices that on uh, outside of a barbecued meats, um, like a pork roast or 
um, this would be a great steak wine because um, it'll kind of bring out some of those, especially those grill marks that you get on things that would really kind of um, work with this as well. Uh, when it comes to cheeses, of course, now you can get into a little bit more complex things. Um, you can get some older ones. So, I mean, a really good aged Gruyere or really aged, um, you can do an aged cheddar with this one just because it's a little bit more complex. But just sort of be careful that you don't go into a too heavy of a blue cheese with this. I think that the blue cheese, because it's so salty, needs um, more of a fruit and a um, heavier fruit thing. And I think this wine might get lost in it. Um, so if you ordered cheese from us, you'll notice I did not put blue in this one, as much as I'm a huge fan of blue cheese. So hopefully you learned a little bit about uh, the wines from Chile, uh, what you can expect from them. The hottest wines coming from Chile right now that you'll notice in the LCBO are Sauvignon Blanc, right? So we already uh, showed you that before, but Sauvignon Blancs from Chile are hot. The other thing that you th I didn't get to put today, because it's not always easy to find, especially here in Ontario, but if you ever come across a Chilean Syrah, um, especially if you like those um, really big, rounded, um, full fruit styles of red wines, you will love Chilean Syrahs. Sometimes you can find blends that have some Syrah um, in with some Carmenere or Syrah with Cabernet Sauvignon, but for the most part, um, if you can just find a single varietal Chilean Syrah, grab it. I'm sure you'll enjoy it. Um, if you can find the one by Connoisseur, <laughs> um, because I mentioned said value for money. Uh, they don't make a lot of them. Um, we don't get a lot here in Ontario and I find that as soon as they come out, everyone grabs them. So I would maybe start checking your LCBO app a little more often so that you don't miss out. Uh, but in the meantime, uh, stay safe, stay well, uh, depending on when you're watching this uh, particular video. Um, I'm hoping that we are out of whatever lockdown and we've hit over that hump um, of this international crisis that we've been under and hopefully we can um, host you soon again here in the bar and we can chat about wine and pretend that this last year and a half just never happened. <laughs> so in the meantime, I'm gonna grab my glass so I can do a proper toast. Uh, stay safe, stay well, have some wine. Cheers.